But I've got a question for you. When you pray, do you think much about who you are praying to? When you pray, do you think much about who you're actually praying to? Because surely it's important to know who you're praying to. You may have a, a clear idea of, um, of in your head of, of who's listening to you, or sometimes you might even just be thinking, like, feeling like you're talking to the air. What's he like, this God that you pray to? It's important to know who you're praying to. I'm sure that's sort of like the question on my daughter's minds when they come to see me. Are they thinking, of, thinking about whether they're going to go and talk to Dad or ask Dad for some advice or ask him for some help? They're probably thinking about, which Dad am I going to get today? What mood's he in? Is he going to be stressed or chilled? Uh, when I tell him about the car, is he going to be angry or calm? Is he going to poke fun at me? Or is he going to be nice to me? Is he listening? Or is he distracted by the TV? Is he busy? Or is he available? Is dad going to say something wise? Or just something foolish like he normally carries on with? What's dad going to be like? What's, what's this dad that I'm going to today going to be like? Because if I'm in any of those uh, sorts of moods, stressed or or distracted or, or busy or foolish, that could turn my kids off coming to see me. And I'm sure at certain points in time they have felt that way. It's not worth going to talk to Dad right now because I'm not going to get anything good out of him. Who do we pray to? Who do we pray to? What's God like? And how does knowing God impact our willingness to pray or our desire to pray. If God was quick to lose his temper or if God uh, laughed at us or if God was just too busy or, or just never there when we, when we needed him, you'd be turned off praying, wouldn't you? What's he like, this God that we're praying to? It's important to know who you are praying to and it's one of the things that I love about this prayer of Solomon's today at the opening ceremony for the temple that he built for God. It's a great prayer because he talks about who he's praying to. He talks a lot about that. Look at verses 23 and 24 there in the, in the Bible. Uh, in chapter 8, page 515, he says, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue heartily in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. You see what David knows there about God? You see what he, can, he, he knows about who God is that motivates him to pray? He says, God, you are absolutely unique. There is absolutely no one like you. Lots of other nations have idols and statues and things that they pray to, but God, you're different. You're alive. You're a living God and a God who, who makes a covenant with his people. See, every other religion, would be, people would have to make an agreement, with, come up with some sort of agreement with their God. You know, if, uh, hopefully if I do these sacrifices, then God will give me rain. Or maybe if I bow down to this idol seven times a day, then I'll get a good crop, a good harvest. You see, in every other religion, it's up to people to try and make an agreement with God. But with, with the God, the living God, the one true living God, it's the other way around. It's God who makes a covenant with people. It's his idea. It's he, he, he made it up. Our covenant with God was his idea. He wrote it and we enter into it. You don't have to try and bargain with God like, my foolish prayer when I was 14 years old when I said to God, if I could just have that 12-string guitar that's in the shop, then I'll play it in church and I'll play it in youth group. You know, try and bargain with God in, in your prayers. That's foolish, isn't it? Because our, our trust in God doesn't depend on what we can do for him. It's Our trust in God is based on who God is and what he's like. There's no negotiation or bargaining. You either accept God's covenant and keep it 
or you reject it. And God has a covenant full of good promises and blessings for us, but also warnings about what's going to happen if you walk away from him. What are you going to do with God's covenant, with God's promises? Are you going to accept them or reject them? But what um, Solomon knows about God is how faithful God is to his covenant promises. You see there in verse 24, in those words in verse 24, don't you? With your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it. And he goes on in verses 25 and 26. Now, Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him. And down in verse 26. And now, O God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David, my father, come true. You see what Solomon's saying there? God, you are the one who's going to make this covenant happen. We, we can't do it. We need you to do it. We need you to keep those promises the way you have said it will happen. We are completely dependent on God's faithfulness and power. You see, if God wasn't the author of the covenant, then you'd have to continually be trying to bargain with him. If God wasn't faithful to his promises, then you'd never really be sure whether you could go to him. You'd feel uneasy about praying to him because you're not sure if he's going to keep his promises. It'd be a waste of time. But what Solomon says here is true. He says, God, you are a God who makes promises and you are a God who keeps his promises. I can trust you. And so he comes to God. What was your dad like? What was your dad like? Did he have good intentions to do everything he could to, um, to give you a secure future? Was he a trustworthy dad, a man of his word? Sadly, not everyone can say that about their dads. But we have a good father in heaven who has made a good covenant with his people and who is absolutely faithful to it. So we have every reason to go to God with absolute confidence because of who he is. Not because of who we are and how, how strong our faith might be in him, but it's because of who he is. We can trust him. I did some marriage counselling with a couple well, quite a few years ago now, and um, not, not in Narrabri, so you don't have to try and guess who it was. Uh, this um, couple had lots of issues, and the, the foundation of all the issues in their marriage was a complete lack of trust. You see, she'd been burnt before. She'd been uh, betrayed before in a previous relationship. And she just figured, well, all men must be the same. And so in this new relationship, there was no trust, no trust at all. And she'd say, said things like, I'm not going to let that happen again, what happened to me before. And the relationship was fragile to breaking point. But you see, we belong to a covenant God who has made promises and who keeps his promises. He is absolutely faithful to his word. You can trust him. See, the strength of your relationship with God is not how faithful you are, but how faithful he is. And it's the same with praying. Prayer is based on the character of God, not your character. Because if prayer was based on, on my character, well, one, some days I'd have good days and some days I'd have shockers. But prayer is not based on my character. It's based on what I know of God and who he is. He is completely trustworthy. He is a good and faithful heavenly father. And so we can have complete confidence to go to God and tell him everything. Even when you failed to keep your side of the covenant. You see, God will always keep his side of the covenant. But what about when you failed to keep your side of the covenant? And sometimes we get those thoughts in our heads, don't we? Like, does my sin nullify my prayer? In other words, does, does God stop listening when we fail to be faithful? You ever had those thoughts? Is God really listening to me? Maybe I'm just not good enough. Maybe I've, I've failed him too much. Well, Solomon was confident in prayer not just because God was a covenant faithful God, but because God was a God of justice and forgiveness. And he goes on, look at verse 30, what he says in verse 30. Hear the supplication of your servant, 
and of your people Israel, when they pray toward this place, hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. He knows God is a God of forgiveness, but he also knows God is a God of justice, verse 31. When a man wrongs his neighbour and is required to take an oath and he comes and swears the oath before your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act. Judge between your servants, condemning the guilty and bringing down on his head what he has done. Declare the innocent not guilty and so establish his innocence. You see what he knows about God? God is a righteous judge and he freely forgives those who turn to him. God is both the judge and the forgiver. And he brings up a few scenarios. Look in verse uh, 33. Uh, see what uh, the scenario is there. What, when, when, what's happening there? He says, when your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you. And down in verse 34, when they turn back, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them out of the, uh, back to the land you gave them. So that's the first scenario. When, when, they've, when they're being overrun in battle and they turn back to you, hear and forgive because, God, you are a trustworthy and a righteous and a forgiving God. But what's happening in verse 35? He says, when there's a drought and uh, there's no rain, the rain's stopped. But when people turn back and confess their sin and confess your name, then hear and forgive and send rain. I wonder when, when you pray for rain, do you start with confession? You start with asking God's forgiveness when you pray for rain. What's happening in verse 37? All sorts of nasty things are happening in verse 37. Look there. When famine or plague comes to the land or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, or when an enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whenever, whatever disaster or disease may come, where a prayer or plea is made by any of your people, Israel. Verse 30, uh, 39, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and act. Deal with each man according to all he does. You see, Solomon is completely confident in God's justice and God's forgiveness. He knows that God is a righteous and just God and he will bring about what's right. But he also knows God is a God who forgives. When people turn to him, he will forgive them. And we pray, don't we, fully aware that God is righteous and just and that we fall far short of his expectations and his perfection. We, but we're also fully confident that God is merciful and forgiving and he wants us to turn back to him. We are completely undeserving of any goodness from God, but he is full of grace and mercy. See, if you feel unworthy to pray, it's not necessarily a bad thing. If you feel unworthy when you're praying, it's not necessarily a bad thing because it's really the honest truth, isn't it? None of us are worthy of God's goodness. But if you feel unworthy uh, when you pray and it stops you from praying, that's a bad thing. Because what's happened is you've stopped trusting in God's forgiveness and mercy and grace. See, our prayer is not based on who we are and how good we are and, and how faithful we are. Prayer is based on God and his faithfulness to us. It's what you know about God that motivates you to pray. One of the most annoying things about being a minister, there's a few annoying things about being a minister, but one of the most annoying things about being a minister is when people um, think that God listens more to my prayers than he does to theirs. And so people will say, oh, Tim, you better pray for me uh, for this situation because, uh, you know, God will be listening to you. Uh, you better pray for rain. You better pray for whatever it is they've got. You know, if you pray, God will listen. But I always say, well, what are you doing about it? Are you praying? Because even if I was more righteous than you, and that's arguable, but you just ask my wife, even if I was more righteous than you, I still fall a million miles short of God's righteousness. Why would God listen to my prayers any more than to your prayers? You see, a prayer is not based on who we are. 
on our faithlessness or our faithfulness or ever having a good day or a bad day. Prayer is not based on us. Prayer is based on the faithfulness of God, the character of God, the trustworthiness of God. David's prayer in uh, Psalm 5 uh, well, is going to help us. We're going to look at that on the screen, I think, uh, from Psalm 5. Uh, David says these words. He says, listen to my words, Lord. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. But I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence I bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness. Make your way straight before me. You see what he says there in verse 7? He doesn't say, but I, because of my goodness or because of my righteousness. He says, no, but I, by your great love. We can pray to God because he loves us, not because we love him. In Psalm 63, uh, David's again praying, and Ben's going to show us these words. Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. You see, his prayer is based on God's character, God's goodness, God's power, God's glory, God's love. It's not our faithfulness that makes our prayers worthwhile. Do you go to God even when you feel like a failure? I remember phoning my dad as a teenager uh, to admit that I'd crashed his car and I was fearful and I was anxious. I was sure he was going to be angry. I thought he was going to do his block. And he, it made me, I thought he was going to make me pay for my stupid mistake. And it made me just fearful about ringing dad and telling him what had happened. But to my surprise, his first words were, are you okay? Because that's all that matters. And it was then that I realized I could go to dad, even when I'd stuffed up. Because he was going to treat me kindly. He was going to show mercy and grace to me. Undeserved mercy and forgiveness. Are you confident when you pray? How can we be confident that God is a just and merciful God? How can we be confident that God made a covenant full of promises, that God is absolutely faithful to those promises, that God is ready to forgive? How can we be confident in all that? Well, see, Solomon didn't have the advantage that we have. Solomon could see what God had done in his time, but we've seen much more because we've got Jesus. And we've seen that God is faithful when we look at Jesus. We've seen uh, that God is a covenant-keeping God when we look at Jesus because God's covenant is all about Jesus because God's faithfulness is displayed in the face of Jesus and in the death of his son because God's mercy and forgiveness come through Jesus. So we can be confident. And Ephesians chapter 1 is going to tell us that. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him, in Christ. In love, he predestined us to be adopted to sonship through Jesus Christ, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Who's that? Jesus. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. You see, everything that we have, all our confidence in God is because of Jesus, because everything we have comes through Jesus. Forgiveness, love, adoption, all of those come through Jesus. And our confidence in God's faithfulness, is in Jesus. We can be confident because we know that Jesus lived, died, rose again for us. And our confidence to pray is because God is faithful to his covenant promises. You can see it there. That's how faithful he is. He's given us everything in Christ. So this is the first sermon in a series of five sermons on prayer. And in in this series, we're going to be talking about uh, what to pray, when to pray, where to pray, how to pray, all those sorts of things. We're going to be touching on those topics. But prayer is not about a formula. 
Prayer is not about a matter of saying the right words at the right time, about mindless repetition. Prayer is not a last resort. Prayer is based on God, God and his character, who he is, his faithfulness, his trustworthiness. And that's where our confidence comes from. When my kids come to me, I hope they strike me on a good day, at a good time. Hopefully when my kids want to come to me, I'm relaxed and calm. I'm not busy or distracted. Hopefully I've got something wise to say. I'm not foolish or mucking around. But I'm not even, I'm not even confident in myself that that's always going to be the case. But every time you go to God, you can know that he is trustworthy. Every time you know, go to God, you can know that he is faithful to his covenant promises. Every time you go to God, you can know that he's forgiving and he's righteous. See, prayer is about being confident in who God is and what he has done. And when you know God and the wonder of who he is, you'll find that prayer comes much more naturally. So what do we got to do? We've got to soak ourselves in the faithfulness and mercy and forgiveness, and love, and compassion, and power, and promises of God. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you that you indeed are a faithful and trustworthy God. We thank you that all we have comes from you, from your covenant, which is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. All your promises come true in him. Father, I pray that you would help us to be confident as we grow to know you more and more that will be confident to pray because we can trust you. We can't trust ourselves all the time, Lord, but we can always trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.